right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Mogul Marathon Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Yannick Cujo Virgil. I'm super excited for our guest today. You might know him from Bigger Pockets. I certainly do. His name is Greg Dickerson. Now, Greg is a serial entrepreneur, real estate developer, coach, and mentor. He has bought, developed, and sold over $250 million in real estate, built and renovated hundreds of custom homes and commercial buildings, developed residential and mixed-use subdivisions, and started 12 different companies from the ground up. Greg currently coaches and mentors some of the top entrepreneurs real estate investors, and real estate developers around the world, helping them start, grow, and scale their business, raise more capital, and do bigger deals. Now, Greg's current clients have over $2 billion in assets under management and deals in process. Greg is also an expert on the topics of entrepreneurship, leadership, and real estate, and is regularly interviewed on some of the top real estate investing and business podcasts today. Greg, I'm so, so happy for you to be on the show today. Hey, Yannick, thanks for having me. And I'm happy to add the Mogul Marathon to that list. Absolutely, absolutely. So we we definitely wanted to have you on the show because you have a wealth of knowledge. I mean, you've been in real estate for how many cycles? <laughs> yeah, this is my third uh, cycle as, you know, being a real, you know, owner of real estate. I wasn't really active the first cycle, you know, late 80s, early 90s, but uh, going into the mid to late 90s, into the 2000s, I went through that whole thing. And of course, 2009, I was hot and heavy at it. Um, you know, had, I don't know, $30 million worth of uh, development loans that uh, were uh, interesting to work through when the bank started collapsing and nobody wanted to lend money anymore and things like that. And now, you know, this this cycle here, which is very different than anything we've ever experienced before. So, yeah, it's been a number of cycles. It's been a lot of lot of fun, a lot of different, you know, types of businesses, types of real estate deals, a lot, you know, very diverse background experience. And, you know, the biggest thing is I started from nothing with absolutely nothing. I didn't go to college. I went in the Navy right out of high school, uh, educated myself, learned the hard way. But I learned by doing deals with uh, other investors and developers. I learned from a lot of other investors and developers and uh, surrounded myself with people that were better than me, smarter than me and learned from uh, those people that had done what I wanted to do, had been where I wanted to be and were doing the things that I wanted to do. So, you know, it was like a, it was like a, you know, coaching, mentorship, mastermind, immersive experience that I kind of, the way I learned the business. And, you know, that's why I do what I do now to help other people and, you know, pass along the knowledge that I've, that I've learned over the years. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, you're, you're perfect from a perspective of, you know, what we like to do on this show, right? It's just, letting people know that you can become a real estate mogul from nothing, right? You don't necessarily have to have a business degree. You don't necessarily have to have a master's degree. You really just have to have the ability to make things happen. And one of those things as well as just through hustle and tenacity and just waking up every day and just getting after it. That, and, that's it. And, you know, you're, you're a professional athlete and, you know, a lot of your listeners are, and it's all about that discipline, that hustle, that work ethic, that focus, and, you know, educating yourself, right? You got to learn the playbook. And, you know, for me, like that 250 million, I did that with my own money. That was not, was not investor capital. That was me, my own money. And what I did was I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And when I read that book, what I got out of it, most people get, they want to be Robert Kiyosaki or they get, they want to do real estate or whatever. When I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, what hit me, and I read that book in 1997 when I started my full entre entrepreneurial journey, um, I wanted to be Rich Dad because Rich Dad was the guy that had all the businesses. He had all the real estate. He was teaching everybody and everybody was coming to him for opportunities and deals and things like that. So that's who I wanted to be. So what I got from the book was build businesses that generate cash flow to invest in other assets that sustain your lifestyle and the things that you want to do. So that's what I did. I started building companies and I did that first. I was an entrepreneur uh, before I was a real estate investor and developer. So I built companies first. I used the cash flow from the companies to invest in other assets. And then when I exited some of my companies, I took that money and then re reinvested it in you know, real estate, um, you know, development projects, things like that. And that's what I teach people how to do. You know, professional athletes, you know, your business is your income, right? So you want to invest that and you want to grow that and you want to protect that. Um, you know, I work with people that are made a ton of money in crypto lately, you know, over the last few years, and I'm helping them pivot and get into businesses and real estate and things like that. People in the stock markets back in 2000, 2001, during the dot-com boom, I had a lot of people that were making, you know, cashed out of their stocks 
and then came to the area that I was in and put it in real estate. So I was doing real estate deals for and with them from their stock earnings. So that's to me what it's all about. You know, have income streams or businesses that generate revenues that you can reinvest in other assets to grow that wealth. Yeah. Yeah. And and honestly, you know, from my, you know, research on different moguls and people who have mm-hmm. done extremely well in real estate, a lot of those uh, men or women, you know, had those businesses, right? Because those businesses provided the cash flow to, you know, withstand things that you might have in the development space, right? Development is a risky game. It's a very cash intensive game compared to maybe just acquiring a cash flowing, you know, value add multifamily building, right? I've seen a lot of people take that route and it just allows you to be liquid, right? Because when you have a business that's producing cash flow, you can take advantage of, of different opportunities. Is that how you were thinking as well? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's the big thing. I mean, so real estate development, uh, thats that was my trade. That's what I did. I was a builder first. So for me, it wasn't risky because I knew what I was doing. So real estate development is risky if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to, you know, uh, assess and accurately calculate the risk and withstand uh, what that could look like if the worst case scenario happens. So once you understand those things and you know what you're doing, it's really not that risky. You know, you can you can calculate the risk and the downside and you and you'd be able to withstand it. The other thing it takes is deep pockets. So it doesn't have to be your deep pockets, but somebody's got to have the money because the entitlement process is expensive. It takes patient capital. It takes, you know, longer term capital. And you have to be able to stomach, you know, challenges and things, you know, that that arise and changes. And, you know, that's that's where the real opportunity lies. As an entrepreneur, as a real estate developer, I look for problems. I welcome problems. I welcome challenges because that's what we do. As entrepreneurs, you know, we solve problems. You know, we overcome challenges. We make things happen and we get things done. That's what entrepreneurs do. That's what real estate developers do. And that's what I like about real estate development is because it's way more challenging than just buying any building and renovating it. That's fun. That can be challenging too. But real estate development is very different because you're working with so many different people from the ground up, you know, and, and I love just bending down on the, on the job site, you know, before it starts that land and just picking the dirt up and smelling it, visualizing that project before it ever, you know, before you ever even do anything, before I even hire the first design professional or, you know, engineer or whatever and start the process, you know, I can see exactly what that project is going to become literally down to every last detail, like who's walking in and out of the door and, you know, all that kind of stuff and the cars that are parked around and how it fits into the environment. So it's a very, it's a creative, visionary, entrepreneurial, challenging, opportunistic business model. And that's, you know, just as you can see, it's just, you know, I'm very passionate about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, I can feel it, feel it. It's, you kind of brought me back to like the football, football days, right? When I just used to pick up the turf and just smell it and, and run around and, 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 and lay down in it. So, man, I'm, I'm super excited to have you on the show. But before we jump into the development side, I'd love to get your take on the economy today and interest rates, right? Things have increased um, dr- dramatically, <laughs> dr- sorry, um, drastically uh, over the past, let's say, nine months or so, right? Um, yeah, probably the dramatically, dra- drastically and dramatically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's <laughs> that, that, that's where I was. That's where I was going with it, right? I think both of those words just kind of came together. But um, you know, I had this hunch that we just can't go back to high interest rates. You know, since the, you know, the 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 height of the recessions when things, you know, quantitative quantitative easing started happening, and we had these low interest rates, and um, you know, I think the psychology of real estate too may, might have something to do with that, right? Because I got into real estate, let's say, uh, was it 2018 or so, right? So I'm used to low interest rates, right? And obviously, you know, interest rates have a direct impact on what someone can pay for the property, right? So being able, like staying in, you know, high interest rates, I don't think that our economy can stomach that. I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, the economy today and and what you think about interest rates moving forward and how the Fed should should act on that. Yeah. So you're not alone. There's a lot of people your age group that are just getting into markets, stocks, crypto, real estate, businesses. So all you really know is just up only exponentially very distorted levels of everything over the last two to three years. I mean, it's just that's just not normal. You know, even the dot com bubble in stocks, you know, that was just limited to a few tech companies. This has been every asset class all across the board over the last few years. And it's very it's a very distorted level of what we've seen. So, um, you know, where we're at now is a corrective cycle. It's all business cycles. And, 
you know, it, it's the business cycle is, you know, it's peaks and valleys, right? You have your peaks, you have your valleys, you have your peak, you know, it's just how it works. Every 10, 15 years, 20 years, you go through these things. Real estate's the same way. Real estate's a feast or famine business. Always is, always has been, especially real estate development and building and things like that. So the key is, is to understand the business cycles, what drive them, how long they last and, you know, what the factors are in the economy and how the economy's changed, you know, from an industrial, you know, agrarian age to industrial to a, you know, tech driven society. And now we're in a whole different world where data and artificial intelligence and information and attention are what's valuable and what we're creating now versus, you know, we're not looking for the next iPhone. You know, I mean, we're not looking for, we're not going from an eight track tape to a cassette, to a CD, to, a, you know, an MP4, MP3. Um, you know, we're, we're there now. Now it's the other aspects of that and the cloud based, you know, uh, data intelligence, artificial intelligence and, you know, peer to peer exchanges of value and the blockchain, things like that. So, uh, you know, it's a very different cycle that we're in. When you talk about interest rates, where rates are now are pretty normal, you know, in all things considered. So back in my career, the most of the most of the building and development business I was doing, I was paying nine, 10 percent interest. That was good. Um, you, you know. 5% interest was super, super low when it got to that level um, right in the, you know, late, uh, well, you know, around the 2008, 2009 period when rates had dropped down so low, that's kind of what spiked the market. You know, we were in the interest only four and a half to 5%, but we never saw threes, never even thought that was possible. And, uh, you know, so getting where we were the last couple of years with interest rates has just been, it's just been an unbelievable, unreal not even something that I think we could ever revisit again. So the where we're at right now is we do need higher rates for longer. We do need everything to reset and we do need a rebalancing because a lot of people have been priced out of housing. Um, you know, a lot of the, the deals that were done are unsustainable. Um, and a lot of the values that were placed on businesses, companies, stocks, you know, cryptos, real estate, everything, were just hyper distorted and unsustainable. You just can't sustain those levels because at some point they just don't make any sense. So it's liquidity cycles. So the Fed's been on this path since 08, 09, you know, just juicing the economy with liquidity, quantitative easing, buying treasuries and, you know, bonds and things like that, but keeping interest rates artificially low. And we were doing fine for a long time. We didn't see any real inflation at all for a really long time, but we were kind of getting there. We were working our way towards you know, that and then the catalyst was the pandemic, right? You know, restricting supply in all areas, inventory levels on real estate dropping, interest rates going so low that it created competition for assets because what investors look at where where companies and real estate and things like that are priced, um, you know, relative to interest rates is because as an investor, if I can get a yield or risk-free yield in treasuries at a certain percentage, um, it needs to be compelling for me to move into risk assets you know, for that yield. So treasuries have dropped so low that risk assets look really good, you know, at two, three, four, you know, cap on, on properties. When you look at that relative yield, what's happened now is treasuries got to a point where I could get a risk-free yield at four, four and a half percent. So to attract me to a risk, risk asset, interest rates had to go up, you know, for that to make mm -hmm. sense. So we're kind of in that area now where rates have somewhat leveled off. Um, the big question is, can they go higher? Will they go lower? Nobody knows the answer to that question. The recession is going to answer that question once we get to that next year and we start to see what does a recession look like, how deep, how long, how bad globally, not just here in this country, and what are the central bank's response to that. And in a recessionary environment, ideally, you know, bond yields will drop, stock market will drop, interest rates will drop, you know, generally. And that's when the Fed, when you go into a deep recession, the economy contracts. Uh, that's when the Fed can reduce rates. And that's the pivot everybody's looking for and talking about. But we're not there yet. We're, we still have a very strong consumer. We still have a very robust economy. We're starting to see some layoffs here and there, but it's it's still really too early to expect interest rates to come down anytime soon. But in order to get inflation in check, the Fed funds rate has to be higher than the rate of inflation. Inflation's 8% still. Fed funds rate's only in the fours. They're going to raise again next week, uh, half of, you know, 50 basis points, 75. We don't know yet. We're going to find out as we get closer to the end of this week, get into next week, we get the next inflation report. Um, but, you know, you can't really expect in interest rates to come back much further than where they're at now uh, without the economy going into a real problem. And, you know, bond yields are the key to everything because most of the rates in real estate are priced off that 10-year yield. 
Uh, and then the banks, they use the Fed funds rate, you know, for, you know, rates at the bank. So um, those two are kind of somewhat in lockstep with each other. So right now we're kind of peaked. It seems like on inflation, we're kind of peaked wh where it seems on interest rates because of bond yields. But the Fed funds rate still needs to go higher and it needs to stay there for a while to get everything down and get everything back in check to where we can get back to a three to four to five percent inflation rate versus eight. But that Fed funds rate is going to stay in the fives in order for that to happen. So that ideally should keep interest rates about where they're at in that five to seven, five and a half to seven percent range, which is normal historically and good uh, historically. Yeah, no, that's a great analysis of of the economy and interest rates, especially from your perspective of seeing different cycles and and being um, witness to a lot of different things that the that the Fed has done over your you know your years in real estate. Um, and you brought up a really good point about, you know, a risk asset versus a risk free asset. Right. Um, because the Treasury, like you mentioned today, you know, maybe a two year Treasury is like four and a half percent. Right. Um, and if you're going into maybe a, a, an acquisition for a multifamily deal, you know, cap rates haven't, you know, uh, decompressed as, mu as, as, as much as interest rates have, have increased. Right. So it's that spread between your interest rate and, and you know, where you're going in at a property that's making things very, very difficult to pencil. Yeah, I'm curious about, you know, your right thoughts now, on that so as well. Dropped a little bit, but that's not a good thing. You know, that, that they're pricing trouble. So a lot of people are looking for that Fed pivot and thinking that, you know, when the Fed backs off rates, everything's going to be off to the races again. That's not how that works. When the Fed is backing off and when bond yields are dropping, that's bad news. So, you know, that means there's troubled, you know, waters ahead. So, um, just kind of, you know, keep an eye on that and just kind of be aware of that. And we might get a little bit of, you know, a flurry of activity before that. But, you know, if that economy starts falling off a cliff and bond yields come way down and the Fed starts lowering rates, that means you've got real trouble ahead. Yeah, that's that's a great analysis. So where are you seeing, you know, where do you think there is going to be opportunities in the next maybe 12 to 24 months? Right. I read the other night, you know, there's 52 billion dollars in CMBS loans that have a maturity date within the next 12 to 24 months, you know, that may not meet the debt service coverage ratio requirements to, to get them out of the, of a distressed position. You know, do you think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for real estate investors and should we have, you know, some, some dry powder on the, on the sidelines to take advantage of opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's already happening now. Deals are already uh, struggling that had uh, interest only, you know, short-term interest only loans to get them through a renovation process or a repositioning process, or even a development process where you had a, construction loan that's out of the ground now and now you got to go to permanent financing and the rates are two three percent higher than you know what you had pro forma uh and and you know contemplated so that affects the value that affects the cash flows that affects what lenders are willing to lend and the lenders are already uh getting more restrictive in other areas requiring you know higher reserves lower ltvs things like that so a lot of things change other than just the values and just the cash flows what the lenders require. They want more equity. They want more, you know, less, uh, you know, uh, loan amount to equity. They want to hire DSCR, you know, things like that on certain assets in certain markets. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of opportunities there. There's a lot of opportunities to take over some businesses. You know, there's a lot of people exiting, you know, companies now and businesses like trades businesses, you know, things like that. Um, you know, small to mid-sized businesses where, you know, younger people can come in and take them over and, you know, get them to the next, you know, next level and next cycle of the economy. So there's there's opportunities everywhere out there. It's a little early yet. We haven't seen you know real distress yet, but there are some pockets here and there where you're starting to see some cracks and, and see some things and things might be in the next 12 to 24 months. And I think uh you know there's it's it's tough to make deals pencil even in this environment on the acquisition side of things. I mean even bridge debt is just super expensive. The cap markets are just, you know, exp <laughs> super expensive to buy a cap today. Um, I think, um, you know, it's it's very challenging from the capital markets perspective. And I think now more than ever, it's very important for you to focus on fundamentals going into yeah. real estate. And again, it's not bad. It's all relative, right? The cap rates compressed so much, values went, went up so much, it doesn't make sense right now. But once those values adjust, then things start to make sense again, based on, you know, current rates and the current rate environment. And we're seeing that. We're seeing deals retrade uh, that were under contract. We're seeing sellers start to adjust their prices, but it takes a while. You know, sellers are very stubborn historically, 
And if you have a if you have a seller that doesn't have to sell, they're going to hold their price and they're 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 kind of married to where rates were. It takes a while, even after 2008 and 9, we saw the same thing. And I was in that era of where you are now to where it was pretty much up only, uh, you know, from the mid to late 90s into the, you know, uh, mid 2000s, that 2009, 2010 era. Um, it was just straight up. I mean, we just, you know, they ain't making any more of it. Real estate only goes up. I mean, that was my philosophy uh, because I didn't really know anything else. Even though I'd seen cycles before, it just didn't seem like rates would ever go up again. And, you know, sure enough, they did. And sure enough, they can. And even now rates can go a lot higher if we get another issue. So, I mean, we're not done yet. And I mean, they, you know, rates can go to 10, 15 percent. Who knows? It just depends on what's going on in the economy and what what those investors are doing and, uh, you know, how high those bond yields go. So uh, there's still a lot of risk out there right now. But, uh, you know, it's it's all relative. And if the rate environment continues, then you're going to see housing adjust. You're going to see you know, commercial assets adjust to your point. CMBS is a much more fluid and, you know, more rapidly adjusting market than residential housing. Residential housing is way more sticky in this environment because you don't have a stressed, you don't have distressed credit like you do in the CMBS market, commercial markets. Yeah, that's uh, a great, great analysis. And, and and I love your insight on on that. I think, um, you know, to, today's environment is, it is volatile. And I think in, you know, in, in times of turbulence, um, in times of, you know, bumpiness, I think what you can just rely on is just focusing on how can you, you know, preserve your capital, right? How can you get into deals where you're not super exposed? Um, you don't have overly aggressive assumptions because we just don't know what where things are going to be. I don't think that rent growth is going to be, you know, five, 10% for the next two years and you'll be able to get out and, of, of a deal with a really nice cap rate. You know, it's a lot of things that might be uh, you know, might not occur, you know, in the next 12 to 24 months. But I think focusing on capital preservation and strong fundamentals would help investors, you know, uh, go through this this time. Yeah. And building your base, going back to your fundamentals, educating yourself, building yourself, building your team, focusing on those things and strengthening your foundation to be ready, uh, you know, your investor base, all those things to be ready to take advantage of opportunities when they come along. And uh, and yeah, getting realistic on projections, because again, what we saw the last two years is very distorted perspective, you know, perspective of what things can do rents. You know, they bumped 20, you know, 30, 40 percent uh, in some markets over the last couple of years, whereas normally you'd underwrite two to three percent rent growth a year, uh, you know, at that. So, you know, you got to get back to this is a five year, seven year, 10 year hold. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen in a year or two like we saw on some of these deals and rents are going to go up a couple of percent a year you know, not 10% a year and things like that. So, yeah, you know, just getting back to normal levels. Again, it's just, you know, very distorted levels because there was, I mean, there was what, $4 trillion or whatever it was pumped into the economy over the last, you know, few years. I think we're maybe more than that, like 6 trillion or something. It's just, it's just liquidity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to totally agree. Totally agree. It's, it's the Fed has been on a, on a tier just pumping, you know, money into the economy. So it's not just the Fed. So it was everything. So you had the government with stimulus. So all the stimulus checks that went out, all the unemployment bonuses that went out, you know, all of those, the PPE, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that was trillions and trillions of dollars of extra cash that went into the economy. You know, some people obviously were, were struggling and needed it and things like that. But for a lot of other people, it was just bonus money. So that's what drove the markets. You know, that's what drove stocks. That's what drove the gambling phase. That's what drove crypto. Uh, and, it, you know, that's what drove exuberance in those areas. And then on the real estate side, yeah, the injection of capital, the Fed all, all along was buying, or they were buying, you know, mortgage backed securities all through the pandemic. You know, when we had very distorted values of housing, very unhealthy housing and commercial real estate market, and they were still buying, you know, uh, I don't know, $100 billion worth of MBS every month, propping it all up and keeping, keeping rates artificially low when they should have started correcting way back then. So, uh, yeah, they they messed up big time. Yeah, well said, well said. So you're in the the, the, the development space, right? Um, you know, a lot of our listeners might might be in the syndication space, multifamily. I'm in syndication. both. So I'm in both. I work with people yeah. in both. I've done both. So right, yeah. So I'd love to get your take on you know should syndicators who primarily kind of focus on multifamily get into the development space when we talk about maybe distressed assets, right? I think of something like office, for example, right? Um, you know, DC office, for example, is brutal in today's environment. There's a lot of talk about um, conversion from office to multifamily. You know, 
should we be looking at those opportunities as well? Should our listeners be interested in those opportunities? And and if so, you know, how can they kind of look at things and do a sniff test maybe to see, you know, if, if this is something that they should pursue? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of your best deals can be made in what's, what you're talking about. It's called adaptive reuse, where you take an office building, turn it into residential, or you take a hotel, motel, turn it into residential, or take some of those and convert them into hotels or condo conversions. I mean, there's all kinds of different things, industrial buildings. You know, you're you're in Baltimore, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you've seen a lot of that going on where you take the old industrial corridors and sectors and convert them into mixed use and that kind of stuff. I mean, that's where sometimes the best opportunities can be. But just to kind of be clear on what you're talking about. So syndication, that works in real estate development. I mean, that's a that's a strategy in real estate development and opportunity. You know, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Syndication is pooling capital. It's pooling resources that, you know, you don't have for multiple parties to do bigger deals. So syndication is a thing you do in business with companies. Uh, you do it with real estate deals. You know, you can syndicate a horse, you know, for race horse racing. So syndication is just pooling capital to do bigger deals or to do, you know, things you can't afford on your own. Uh, or you don't have the capital to do on your own. So that's all syndication is. So when you do a real estate deal and you're raising capital from investors, you're syndicating that deal. Uh, when it comes to strategies of real estate, you have opportunistic, which is ground up development or adaptive reuse, heavy lift uh, value adds type, type stuff. So you have opportunistic, the most risky, highest reward. You have value add, little less risky, little less you know re reward uh, margins. Then you have what's called core, which, you know, maybe you go in there and it's a good stabilized asset that's newer. And maybe you go in there and you raise rents or you add other revenue streams, things like that. And then you have core plus and core plus is just pretty much nothing. It's a bond play. You know, it's a it's a class A property in a class, you know, in a, in a you know primary market, maybe a you know secondary market. It can even be tertiary, but generally it's in a primary market. And these are trophy assets. These are wealth preservation assets. These are bond plays where you're paying a two to three cap for something that's totally stabilized. There's no real upside other than, you know, rents increasing over the years and reducing operating expenses a little bit if you can. So those are the different strategies of real estate that you can engage in and you syndicate all of those or you just, you know, buy them yourself like, you know, sovereign wealth funds, you know, family offices, you know, they'll buy trophy assets that are core plus properties that, uh, you know, need zero work. They're just wealth preservation plays and just trophy assets. And they'll come in and just pay cash for them. Because, you know, when you have hundreds of millions and hundreds of billions of dollars that you need to put to work, that's where they store their wealth is in, you know, assets like that. Yeah. So, so how can, you know, the, let's say the acquisition value add multifamily investors get into some of those adaptive reuse plays, right? Um, how can they, like, how can they do a sniff test? Maybe let's say maybe on a hotel conversion, um, I've heard you on different on different podcasts mention about um, the room sizes and seeing if that makes sense from that perspective. Like what what are you looking for when you typically look for these opportunities? And that might be just a general, probably, you know, not applicable type of question. But I guess I guess my question is, you know, how can investors kind of lean towards that that specific space of real estate so strategy? You have to educate yourself first and foremost on what it is, what it takes, what's required. Number one, you know, if you you know want to focus on converting a hotel, well, how does that even work? How do you do that? So you got to educate yourself on all that. Number two, you got to know your market. So you can't just say I'm looking for you know hotel conversions anywhere in the country. You know, so you need to know not every market's right for that, and you know that asset's not right for every market. Every market's not right for that asset. So you need to understand what market am I going to focus on in this? Okay, so let's say I'm going to take Baltimore and I want to convert you know two story old travel lodge hotels exterior entrance in Baltimore that have, you know, a hundred doors or less. So you start hunting those assets to see what's in the market. And then you have to understand, okay, is there a renter demographic that's going to live in that converted asset in that location? So it's all about highest and best use because the highest and best use of that might not be that. It might be a hotel. It might be, you know, something else. So that's what you want to kind of look at, you know, office building, same thing. If there's an office building or a warehouse or whatever, any kind of an adaptive reuse strategy, you need to understand your market. What's the demand in the market? What's the drivers in the market of that demand? So a hotel is very different than an apartment. It's very different than an office. It's very different than a restaurant. So, you know, that's where it all starts. You have to become an expert or you have to partner with people who are export experts. And then you focus on maybe you're good at raising capital, but you don't understand everything else I just talked about. So you find somebody who does and you say, hey, I can raise capital. You know what you're doing here. Let's partner. And you bring. So that's syndication. It's not just money. Syndication is bringing resources together to do deals that you can't do alone. So maybe one of those resources is, you know, 
expertise. Another one of those resources is raising capital. Another those resources is, you know, financial, uh, you know, due diligence and guidance, you know, and uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, and then you have the capital piece. So that's really where it's at. It's determining highest and best use. Once you determine that, then you have to create the actual business plan and understand what's required to do that conversion. Uh, who's the right contractors? Not everybody can do it. Uh, you, just like anything else, you want to have the right contractor that that's what they do. They're experts in that space, converting these types of buildings. So if you got a residential house builder, you're not going to bring him in to convert a hotel. I'm not saying they can't do it. I'm saying that's just not what they do, right? If you're a running back and you score touchdowns as a running back, you're not going to go play wide receiver. You're going to you're going to be a running back. That's what you do. Sure, I can play wide receiver, but I'm a running back. That's what I do. So, you know, you want to find people that that's what they do. And, uh, you know, same thing when it comes to market analysis and, and stuff like that. So really, you hear me say all the time at the end of the day, you have to become an expert. There's no shortcut. You've got to do the work. You've got to do the research and you need to be able to understand in your markets that you're interested in, you know, where uh, that use is the most appropriate. And then even in that, there's different business models. So in the micro apartment niche, which is what you're talking about converting a hotel, sometimes it's just, you know, general year round type uh, product. Sometimes it's student rentals. Sometimes it's, you know, flexible rentals for traveling professionals, like traveling nurses, things like that. So obviously a big hospital district, like, you know, around the Mayo Clinic is where you'd want to do something like that. Um, you know, around the colleges is where you'd want to do the student rental thing, you know, and then uh, just affordable micro, you know, ho micro apartment kind of things, maybe around downtown where you have younger professionals that don't necessarily need a big apartment, you know, a little micro apartment's perfect. And then they can walk to work and it's all, you know, kind of convenient. So that's kind of a big overview of, you know, how that happens. Yeah. Uh, so that's well said. Well said. And then also, you know, I've, I've seen different operators who are in the development space or adaptive reuse space, you know, utilize maybe um, some tax abatement that, that you know, local city officials might give to developers as well. Is that something that you've currently used before and and um, advocate for to kind of ease off of the, you know, the, the carrying costs or whatever the case may be to get the project to completion? Mostly historical tax credits is kind of the space I've played in. And, you know, those can be available at the local, state and federal level, depending on the projects and the districts you're working in. But then you have the low, you know, low income housing tax credits that you can, you know, use. Uh, there's grants that are available. So there's a lot of different things that are available. And not only do they give you, you know, grants and things like that, but they can also help you with loan guarantees. They can also help you with subsidies. Um, they can help you with density. Sometimes if you do, you know, a certain mix of your product, low income, uh, you get more units, you know, so there's a lot of different, and I've used that. So there's a lot of different ways to deploy different tax incentive strategies, but it really all boils down to what is the city, state, and what's available federally, and what is your market need, and what, what, what can you bring to market at cost. In today's world, it's getting more and more difficult to use the, you know, any kind of a LIHTC kind of a product or things like that, just because, the prices of assets and land, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You, you just can't do it. That's hmm. interesting. That's, in, that, that's definitely uh, interesting. Um, you know, I love yeah, your insight on just, cost. I mean, everything's at all time highs right now. So even with, even with tax incentives, a lot of those deals just don't work out and don't pencil, but some of them do. So it just depends on your area and what the values are and things like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I love your insight on, on, um, you know, the, the different strategies and, and how you kind of look at things. I love the way that you position the um, importance of being an expert, right? Because I think a lot of people might get wide eyed and, and see the numbers and get excited, but you really want to have that team surrounded around you, specifically in the world of development as well, um, because there are a lot of different moving parts and, and facets of the game. And, and just having the right players on your team, I think is, uh, very, very important for success in that space. Yeah. And that's the first thing. So like I, I told you earlier, we were talking you know, offline before this, I have a client that played for the Giants that uh, I'm coaching and helping him become a real estate developer. And that's really what I do from a coaching perspective. I help you become a real estate developer. I help you become a real estate investor. I help you become an entrepreneur and, you know, an investor. And what that requires is, you know, knowledge, skills, expertise, but then surrounding yourself with the right team. So the first thing we did with him was help him surround himself with the right team in that area. Uh, you know, civil engineers, architects, owners, rep, general contractors, banking, all that kind of stuff. 
to be able to bring this project out of ground. And we're, you know, hopefully we're going to be breaking ground next year. We've been working on this for a couple of years, taking it through a rezoning entitlement process, the whole nine yards. So we've learned it all from the ground up. But the first thing we did beyond the education was team. That's the first step. And I helped him make sure he had the right team. And we went through that whole process because he, you know, he had a friend that did this. He knew somebody did that. And I'm like, there's a difference between I can do that and that is what I do. So we went through that whole thing. And, you know, it's a learning curve, you know, uh, in a process. But, um, you know, it's a lot of fun. And he's educated himself along the way. And he's becoming an expert and a developer. And, uh, you know, we're working on some other ventures and things like that. So, yeah, it's it's all about the team. Somebody's yeah. going to lead that team. Somebody's got to be the coach. And uh, and then you have your players and you got to have they have the right players in the right position. If you want to win the Super Bowl, what do you do? You go get Tom Brady and you put him at quarterback and you say, win the Super Bowl. <laughs> you, you don't go get Tom Brady and put him at wide receiver and say, we're going to teach you how to catch now. You're getting older. Now, we want to win Super Bowls. Who's won the most and how did he do it? <laughs> you know, and you yeah, put him in yeah. there and say, go. Whatever you need to do, you tell me. We just want to win. Yeah. I love that, man. I, I love that. That gets me gets me excited. So you've been on this journey for a long, long time now. You know, if you were to start this marathon all over again, you know, what would you do differently that you think would contribute to your success? So I know so much more now than I didn't know back then. So knowing now uh, what I know going and starting over back then, I would have just gone much bigger, much faster. You know, I didn't know how to raise capital back then. I did it all with my own money. Learned it all the hard way. I didn't know how to do anything I'm doing now. I, mean, I started out doing little remodels and I started building spec houses. Then I started developing land. Then I got into commercial and I evolved that over the years. You know, I started with little small businesses and, you know, things like that. I just would have gone way bigger, raised a lot of capital and just done it that way. I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't. The things that are available now weren't available then. You didn't have people like me out there doing coaching and mentorship in these spaces, you know, that's one of the reasons I do what I do because nobody's doing it. And you didn't have masterminds, you know, like we have now. You didn't have online access to instant information. You know, I mean, you had to get as much information as you could get out of books and, you know, things like that. And I educated myself with books and seminars and stuff like that. But again, I, you know, I didn't go to college. I, I didn't have nobody in my family were entrepreneurs. Nobody, you know, they all just, my dad was career military. My mom worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield her whole life. You know, they didn't know. You know, now he taught me how to be an entrepreneur, you know, when I was a kid, he said, hey, if you want something, you go figure out how to make money and get it. So I'd go cut grass, rake leaves, wash your car, whatever. You know, I'd knock on your door. Yannick, my name's Greg. I live down the street. I need to make some money, man. What do you need done? I'll do anything, you know, and yeah. I literally would do whatever. I'd clean your house. I didn't care. You know, I was a little kid, 10 years old, 11 years old. So I learned door knocking. I learned cold calling. I learned how to sell. I learned how to create something out of nothing. But the most important thing I learned was if there's something I wanted, go create the money, the opportunity so I could get it. And uh, and then, of course, there's discipline and all that that went along with it. But anyways, I didn't have the higher level knowledge in terms of how to do stuff and how to go big and things like that. So uh, that's a long winded answer to your question. I would have gone bigger, faster, uh, you know, than, than what I really did and focused more in one core area versus doing all the different things I did. That was great. It's a good experience, but it distracted me from focusing and doubling and tripling down on what, you know, I could have really done. And I'd have been a billionaire by now if I'd have, if I'd have had this information back then. Yeah, that's uh, I love that insight that you just gave. I mean, um, and that's something that I've I stumbled into as well. And and luckily, quickly. Um, so I'm very, very happy to hear you say that as, um, you know, the smaller deals takes a lot of time and, and a, a lot of headache. You know, they can be profitable, but the you want to have the biggest return of your time if possible. And I think going bigger, faster, I think anyone that's listening to this show definitely needs to listen to that message because there can be a lot, a lot of benefits when you are focused specifically on one thing. You know, when you're all over the place, your time and attention is devoted to many different things. But when you're just focused on one thing, you get to become the expert that you mentioned. You get to develop the team that you mentioned. You get to um, be an expert in the market so you can be successful. So I think all of those things are super, super important and great nuggets that someone should pay attention to. Yeah, you're really not limited. And I kind of knew that, but not really to the degree that I know it now. And that that's the biggest thing. And yeah, I mean, I was running around chasing deals where I'd make 10 here, you know, 50 there, 100 here, 300 there. And that's great, you know, but uh, you know, you can do it now, a million here, 3 million there, 10 million here. You know what I mean? So it's a much different world. Yeah, that's perfect. So 
if our listeners are interested in getting into the world of real estate development, you know, you help clients, you have, you know, a program and, and, and coaching um, opportunities, you know, how can our listeners follow you and, and get involved with, with, with uh, your coaching? Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, all my info is on my website, gregdickerson.com. That's the easiest way to remember it. And uh, so, yeah, I have courses that are very affordable. Um, I have a one-on-one coaching program. That's not cheap. Um, you know, but that's access to me, you know, Monday through Friday business hours. And that's where I coach people like, you know, the, the guy in Florida and I've got an endodontist. I work with medical professionals, athletes, entrepreneurs, you know, some people just starting out some that, you know, are, are a little further along, but I have an endodontist that I helped from scratch, get the land under contract, negotiate the deal, get everything going uh, along the way. I helped him, uh, you know, acquire another piece that saved him $3 million on the site work and added another 15 units to the project. He just didn't know. One phone call. I was like, well, just get this piece over here and it'll save you a bunch of money and get some more units. Turned out to save him 3 million bucks and got him 15 more units that are worth a million dollars each. So that wow. wasn't, you know, that was, that was huge. So, I mean, I've got stories like that all day long and it's not just real estate development. So it's real estate development, it's commercial and multifamily real estate investing and, you know, syndication, Um, I help people with building companies, entrepreneurship, you know, starting online, offline companies or growing and scaling their existing companies. One of the biggest things I do uh, with people, including internationally, I've got a guy in uh, UAE that I'm working with and he's a builder and he's got a bunch of other companies, but it's helping them with their leadership skills and building their team. And, you know, what kind of company do I need to become? Who do I need? And how do I lead them? How do I hire, recruit, hire, train, lead, delegate, motivate, develop my people, what does that look like? So there's systems out there like traction and EOS and stuff for entrepreneurs, which is great, but they don't teach you the leadership component. They teach you operating systems, but they don't teach you how to be a leader. So, you know, I help develop people and teach them how do you be a leader and how do you develop your people? So that's a big part of what I do as well. Uh, you know, as well as, you know, helping people with marketing and, you know, people that want to be, you know, coaches, consultants, influencers, you know, help them with their marketing, things like that. And, um, you know, contrary to popular, you know, opinion, I'm not a boomer. I missed that cutoff by a couple of years. So I'm very tech savvy and social media marketing and, you know, what you need to be doing out there in the world of today's currency, which is attention, you know, and, and how to do that right for your different types of businesses, different types of products and different types of services. So anyways, that's all of the things that I do and I help people with. And really at the end of the day, what I help you do is figure out why God put you on this planet how to get the best out of you so that you can impact your community, your family, your community, and the world that you want to impact the way you want to impact it. You know, that's what's fun. That's what's cool is once you realize why God created you and put you on this earth and the ability that you have to impact it before you leave, that's what excites me. That's what's fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can totally relate to that as well. I think real estate is one of those businesses where you can really have the double bottom eye and what, and that's what I call income and impact. And I really love this space because you're able to, like I said, you know, create generational wealth and then also make a profit. And, um, and I'm just really excited that we had an opportunity to, to have you in the show. Um, like I mentioned, you know, I've seen you on bigger pockets when I got into real estate back in 2018 and you, you've, you know, shared a lot of, a lot of knowledge and, you know, we're really, happy that we had an ability to get you on the show. So um, I appreciate that. I'm not super active. Well, I'm not active at all there anymore. I just don't have time for it, but I do have my YouTube channel and I've got thousands of videos on there talking about all kinds of different things, different playlists. And, you know, of course my website, but, um, but you know, all of my threads are still up there. I just, I just don't have time for it these days. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is a lot of work responding to posts. So I totally agree. But uh, Greg, man, thank you so much for, being a guest on our show. Thank you for your insight. We talked a lot about development. We talked about the economy, interest rates, um, mindset, um, you know, everything that that I think our listeners would really enjoy from our podcast today. So thank you for being a guest on our show. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in to another episode of the Mogul Marathon Real Estate Podcast. Let's be great. And remember that real estate is a marathon, not a sprint. So run your own race. Thanks again, 